these are caves and sarcophagi just so people would bury them to get the stench, keep the stench away, but also probably much more than that. I suspect that this is something royal. Yeah. Someone with money is being buried, but we're literally right here on the Sea of Galilee. Of these texts have changed from the geography and the actual locations of investigating. That doesn't mean I'm saying what the text says happened, or what I'm saying is if the text says it, it most likely took place. What it does is no. it brings to life how I'm gonna investigate it and who the author might have been who wrote this material, are they aware of certain things in this area? So we're dealing with a story where Jesus goes to the Gerasim demoniac and he goes to cast out these pigs. And I do think that this is in some way lifting from the Homer's Iliad and right. the Odyssey. However, what I think by coming here, I can't prove it and I'm not gonna try, but what it has done for me is it made me wonder, whoever this person is, are they aware of the geographic location? Are they then slapping a legend or mythology onto a local geographic area? Read far and wide, go and check out the world and go, wow, it's not just Jewish. Yeah. Wow, it's not just Greek. Wow, it's not just Jewish, Greek, maybe whatever people have come into this property. So- Might be something new. Right, and, and when you start to like read wider and open up your mind, so much more can be explored. So here, this is a ruin of a sarcophagus. Somebody probably really important was buried here, as you can see from the uh, description here. Yeah, this was absolutely something, I would say Roman period at least. And this is an archway. These are caves. Yeah, that's, that's definitely Roman architecture. These are caves and sarcophagi, just so people would bury them to get the stench, keep the stench away, but also probably much more than that. I suspect that this is something royal. Yeah. Someone with money is being buried, but we're literally right here on the Sea of Galilee. And it's like, there's a huge city thriving right here around this thing. This history is just so far back and it makes you wonder like, so Tiberius, for example, it's his name after Tiberius. He's appointed as the next Caesar, he's adopted by Augustus, who's the son of God to the Romans. Mm -hmm. And so he takes on this basically king of the world power. He can do anything he wants. And this location right here, you and I, since we've been here, you come, people talk about Israel and they think of Judaism, they think of rabbinic Judaism, they think of you know Sadducees and the Torah and Moses, but they don't realize that the history is Roman and Greek too. Yeah, there's so much. This is something that I think we miss. When we think of Jerusalem, when we think of the area where the Sea of Galilee is, when we start talking about these cities, Magdala, we talk about all this, sure. Right. It, it's just like what Dr. Tabor mentioned when he mentioned Sephora. He goes, that was the largest city in the region there. Like yeah. it was a major city. And Nazareth, which was like this little hillbilly backwater, you know, hamlet. Yeah overshadowed one of the largest cities in the region. Right. And here you have Nazareth to the point where people don't even know what Sephora is anymore. And my right. point is, is I think Christianity in our perspectives, whether it be Judaism or Christianity, has kind of, uh, kind of overshadowed the much larger world, yeah. actually, that was there from the Greco-Roman period. You know who made a good point today? Was the, uh, the guy who took us on the boat in the Lake of Galilee. The Galilee, the Galilee. Sea of Galilee. He yeah. said, think about this. I'm a skeptic, you know, I'm a, I'm a critical approach guy. But I used to say, there's no, there's no pigs in, in Israel. What is this with the pigs, casting demons out of pigs? That couldn't have happened. There's no pigs in Israel. He made a good point. There's a lot of pagans in the north. Mm -hmm. They probably have pigs. It's not that hard to bring. You could bring pigs by boat here and start a farm in the north. Mm -hmm. It's possible. And now that I've seen how you know, there's a, there's little towns, little neighborhoods up here in the north that are uh, Hellenized and pagan. I'm, I, I'm not surprised that if there would be pigs in Israel at that time. Right. So we're dealing with a story where Jesus goes to the Gerasim demoniac 
and he goes to cast out these pigs. And I do think that this is in some way lifting from the Homer's Iliad and right. the Odyssey. However, what I think by coming here, I can't prove it and I'm not going to try. But what it has done for me is it made me wonder, whoever this person is, are they aware of the geographic location? Do they know that somewhere in the region, within the first century or early second century, there were people in certain regions who owned pigs, maybe? You just made my point for me, exactly. And, and it's like, are they then slapping a legend or mythology onto a local geographic area, giving their exactly. and figure? The, and my point is, Mark's not... Mark, a lot of people think Mark has... Some people say Mark's is like, you know, the dumbed-down gospel or whatever. He's actually brilliant. He's the first one to put together this... Scholar, it's a scholarly text. He knows what it's he's pretty, doing. Pretty sophisticated. He's drawing concepts from the Old Testament. He's drawing concepts from the mystery world. And he's probably he's not dumb that he's going to say he's going to throw pigs in the narrative when there's no pigs in Israel. I think he knew that this probably was in the north. So I mean, I'm, I'm making a big deal of a little tiny detail. But what I'm saying is, I'm bringing that I'm bringing that all back to say this, especially in the north, because we're not we haven't been to Jerusalem yet. We don't know much about. Him. We're going to see that. But here up in the north, it's not as strict the there's no str line between judaism and you know the greek world like it's very mixed there's a lot of mixture in the diaspora. I think that when you get to the heartland of Jerusalem, because for so long the prophets spoke about this. I mean, it, it, let's be honest, the Judean uh, people in this region really put themselves as the center of the story. Right. So the closer you get to that little capital, so to speak, the more religious fervor you find. In fact, why is it every year when the Jews would come to celebrate, the Romans would be on high alert because there's more nationalistic kind of mindset that's anachronistic. But my point is, it's like it, it, yes. they know that there's God freed us from Egypt, you know, like and he's going to do it for the Romans, too. And I like John Dominic Crossan's position on this, Absolutely. even though Del Allison and, and, and E.P. Sanders disagree maybe on this this whole political angle of investigating the Gospels this way or thinking there's more to it. But while it's easy to say that many Jews were totally content living under the rule of Rome and they thought, oh, we're cool. And that may be the case. I think the closer you get to kind of Jerusalem or the more religious hometown, they they saw themselves as still that's the priestly class. That's where they're living at. That's where you have the priesthood. That's where you have the temple. That's where all the big festivals are. So that that I can see. I grant that all day. I think that's very like what you're saying. I don't think there's a lot of pagan stuff happening over there. I don't know. But I'm not saying I'm not saying, I'm not saying outside of the temple. You right, don't have that. Right, right, right. And Herod the Great, you make a good point. That's I wanted to I talk mean, about it's that. Like, what we just saw that he strategically placed temples dedicated to the Roman Emperor Augustus. At, at in Caesarea Maritime. Yes. But so, he strategically, strategically places one there and one also up in the north, right by the border of Syria. Yep. Pretty much on the road to Damascus, which is kind of interesting. But he is playing, he's playing both sides. You see, he's a smart guy. Well, he's in, in he's not a fundamentalist. I'm not going to go into what Tabor said today when it came to Herod and his descendants and trying to do with pedigree when it comes to genealogies. But holy smokes, is this guy trying to somehow He's trying to be the, the, the most powerful David. man. Yeah. Bro, yeah, the, he is. The, the one thing to highlight about that that he said that made me think, holy crap, he killed his own sons. Right. Think about it. When David... When he found out his sons were going to take over, who's all? If we want to say Herod's a murderer, who's That's, David? If you're the king of the Jews, you got to got to do what the king of the Jews do. So he takes out <laughs> his he takes out his sons that try to the ones that try to come after you know yeah. the kingship, and he's still on the throne till he hands it off. That's it, and he had his forty year reign. But um, he's trying. Herod was trying. I just thought that was interesting. But you're right about the pagan in the Jewish world. And you really have to ask yourself, like, even if we said Jerusalem, is it really even fair to say that in Jerusalem it was strict and they didn't have pagan ideas? And Not 100% pure, no. But I would say more. it's less than it is here. So, so I would say up in the north here, you have a lot more Orphic stuff, you know, Sibylline oracles, this, this, that, and the third. You know, the Greek world's mixing. The ideas are, Hellenized ideas are, are very popular. Down in the south... And I'm not, you know, I'm not an expert in this, but this is just my thought process right now. I would say it's less than that, but not totally. I'd say it's still happening. Yeah. I just think that's how humans are. We, we can't just be like, like nobody. We, we have this textbook idea of like. 
the, the Jewish world in Jerusalem in the first century, and they were all right. Torah observant. And none of them, everybody just, you know, they were robots, and they just p- prayed five times a day, and they didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> no, they were just humans that we're had... We're all human. Yeah, yeah we, all, we all do what we do. And so, yeah. I, I just, I love this. We're in front of some sarcophagi. We don't know this particular area that we're at. We're not sure what the ruins of this is. This is authentic. This is not fake. Yeah. This is a real spot of some sort. And we have ran across so much of this. The one thing I do want to mention is just how my entire perception of these texts have changed from the geography and the actual locations of investigating. That doesn't mean I'm saying what the text says happened or what I'm saying is if the text says it, it most likely took place. What it does is no. it brings to life how I'm going to investigate it and who the author might have been who wrote this material. Are they aware of certain things in this area? Tabor said it best yesterday when I was like, hey, do you think that uh, we were talking about where Jesus is going to get thrown off the cliff, the precipice, right? There's many precipices out there. I'm not going to get into the discussion of the details, but it's like when we say, hey, one through three, three, it absolutely happened. One probably didn't happen at all or zero. It didn't happen. And he's like, you're asking the wrong question. It's not a question of did that happen? We would never know if that actually happened. Is there a precipice, number one? Well, yes, there are many precipices in this area of Nazareth. Okay, so that could raise the likelihood. Did this possibly happen? He goes, he's a kid. They're boys. And so is there a moment when these boys are out here and he's threatening to throw them off? We don't know. At the end of the day, it's just not unlikely that it could right. have happened. And this is the last thing I want to say. When I'm looking at, when I'm going through these texts, my, my first approach is, what, 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 why, why are they putting this there? What, what a historical kernel is there to see? Is this just drawn from some mythology that they're repurposing? Could be the case. Are they trying to fulfill a prophecy that happened in the Old Testament? That could be the case too. Yep. But maybe there is something historically historical there. And maybe that could be the case. I want to see if I can find it. Yeah. And that's that's I think that's fair. I'm I think it's a fair you. approach for this type of stuff. I think anybody who's serious in investigating this stuff should. And if your entire guards get up because someone might say, hey, you know, uh, Jesus actually probably was born in this place called Nazareth. What do you mean he was born? Prove to me he was even born. Prove to me he even exists to begin and, with. And if, if that's what you want, you're not going to see it. Yeah, if you want that, that's fine because you just don't trust the, the text, right? Yeah. No, I mean, if you don't want there to be a guy, if you don't want this to be true, if you do want this, to, that's how you're going to see it no matter what. That's it. You can't, like, you can't force somebody to see, you know what I mean? I mean, yeah, if all you want to dwell on is there's mythology, and then when you find kernels of geographic locations or people that really exist, like Herod Antipas, Herod the Great, John the Baptist, like all these real players in the stories that are really real, then you get to Jesus, and every time Jesus shows up, you have to act like he came out of thin air and he's totally invented within that narrative. Go for it. I think that's more ad hoc. And yeah. less likely than, dude, there's a guy. But on, but on the flip side of that, it's also this, just as ad hoc to say, just to accept it all because it says it. Yeah. So I think it's very healthy to stay healthy right in the middle, have a balance. Don't just accept everything because it's, it's written down. No. Be critical about it. Compare but it also, to other but also literature. give it a fair shake. Read far and wide. Go and check out the world and go, wow, it's not just Jewish. Yeah. Wow, it's not just Greek. Wow, it's not just Jewish, Greek, maybe whatever people have come into this property. So might be something new. Right. And, and when you start to like read wider and open up your mind, so much more can be explored. I mean, I'd like to get a shot just to show what the hotel looks like, literally where we're staying at. Yeah. This is the hotel that me and Neil are staying at. And if we can we walk through. the palm through, trees in front of us. I would see? love to just walk through here real quick as we're looking. Palm trees, Sea of Galilee. Tell, tell us what you're seeing here, Neil. The Sea of Galilee is what, that way? Sea of Galilee, I thought it was back oh, here. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's back here. Yeah. Yep. But yeah, we're, we're here in the north in Israel. Whatever this ruins we is. We saw the border of Syria earlier. We were just right at Syria. We, we pretty much went through the whole north and we're ready to hit the south tomorrow. It's amazing. This whole complex, everything that we've saw, we hope, we hope, we hope that 
our enthusiasm will rub off on you and you will get as excited as we are because there's so much. In fact, this made us absolutely want to go and explore Greece. We want to go explore Europe at some point. I'm not saying tomorrow. I'm saying at some point we have to touch down in these locations. Something yeah. comes to life when you do this it. This will be a normal thing for sure. And maybe eventually we will have a Gnostic and form a myth vision tour. Yeah. We can make something happen. And that's true Gnosis. All right, that's good. That was perfect. You have just attained true gnosis. The demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.